morning. Okay, good afternoon. All right, so now is my time. So <laughs> yeah, let's go. So today, what we'll be looking at, uh, we'll be looking at microscopy and the cell. So we go through it. Any issues or concerns you have, we'll look at those after the fact, okay? So let's start with microscopy and the cell. Now, of course, in a regular world, we would have been looking at this in the lab and it's always quite nice, you know, to buckle down and, and to work the microscope. But because of the different um, issues raised by, by, um, by the viral, yeah. by the viral issues, you know, we don't have hands on where that is concerned. All right. So let me see who just came in there. That was CJ and who, who else? That is, who just Good came in? Good afternoon, everyone. Right, Hello. CJ and Crystal, was it? Amila, sir. Amila, okay. Amila, Amila. Jay, Amila, Jay, sir, Jay. Jamila. Jamila, Olivia? Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got you. All right. And Crystal, Jared, sir. I got it. I got you. Mm -hmm. So today we'll be looking at the microscope. So let's let's have a look at it. And for reasons not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right now it's. <laughs> Our point decides to move a little slowly. It happens, happens sometimes. Okay. So microscopy and the cell. Because of the fact that when we're thinking about the cell, the cell is nothing more, sometimes less than a couple micrometers across, we have to rely upon the usage of the microscope in order to visualize or to see things which are within the cell and also those things that comprise the cell. So structure of the cell and also the organelles and different things which are within the cell itself. So we rely on the microscope to do this function for us. It's very important when we are viewing the cells to appreciate what the microscope looks like. And let's see if we could just quickly look through its structure. Now the word itself coming from the conjunction of two phrases or two words, micro meaning small and scope is view. So these microscopes there used to magnify images or really small objects and specimens. So this is a typical microscope. And I could tell you from, <laughs> in terms of knowledge, prior knowledge, do take note of these pieces or the parts of the microscope. It's a, virtually a routine question that comes in terms of labeling this when you do have your spotter. All right, when you do have the assessment, it is routine. So just take note of these different parts of the microscope itself. The eyepiece and the observation tube, nose piece, the lenses, right? You have both, uh, you, have, you have the objective lens here. Also within the eyepiece, there's a lens as well. Usually the magnification of the lens that is within the eyepiece is actually etched into the steel or whichever metallic part of the eyepiece. So you know what magnification the eyepiece itself brings along. So the total magnification is usually found by multiplying the eyepiece magnification times whatever magnification on the objective lens. Each of these lenses, they have a different magnification and the magnifications of each lens is as well it's etched into the lens, the metal part on the lens. So that's how you know what magnification it is. This is the stage on which you place your slide or your sample so that you can look through and see it. This is how you move around the stage or the platform on which you put your slide using the course, the coaxial stage controls. This is the condenser lens that brings the light to the specimen. So it comes from below and the specimen is placed on a glass 
um, had a little glass slip so that you could see it. And then you have the diaphragm. This regulates the amount of light going through the lens itself. All right, in terms of the microscopes, there are four major microscopes, the dissection, compound, scanning electron, and transmission electron microscope. These are the main ones. For the purpose of this course, the main one we'll be looking at is the compound microscope. We don't have the funds for the scanning and transmission electron microscope. When I was at university, they actually had to get a grant written for a couple hundred thousand dollars that covered the cost of the salary for the person to operate the scanning, like the transmission, sorry, electron microscope, and also for the maintenance of the microscope itself. So it's very expensive in terms of its acquisition and maintenance. And thus far, it's beyond the scope of cost that. So we'll just rely on other sites just to produce the images until we could get, uh, until perhaps we could move towards that stage. Let's just have a look again. Let me just talk a little bit more in detail. So unlike a handheld lens, which usually gives a 10x magnification, 10x means 10 times the original size. The compound has two lenses. One is 100x, the largest one. One is 10x in terms of the eyepiece. So therefore, the total magnification of those two lenses combined, the eyepiece and the objective lens, would be 10x multiplied by 100. So that's how you get this total 1,000. That's the greatest magnification that could be given by a light microscope, which is similar to the one here. So in Costa, we have several of these. And maybe for SNF2, once the um, once things continue as related to COVID, we will be able to get back out and have a look at um, what is happening there, OK? So the parts of the lenses, as I mentioned before, the eyepiece, the tube, and the objective. So the objective lenses, these can actually turn, like on a turn style, they turn. So this whole thing turns, and you align the particular lens um, perpendicular, well, not perpendicular, because that's more, more than 90. That's about 190 and 45, 35, 135. Well, anyhow, you align it such that you could look through and you could see down here. How do you know it's aligned? It has like grooves. So, you know, you're turning it and it goes into a groove. That's how you know it's fixed. And then you can look through and see it. Once it's not in a groove, you don't see anything when you look through here. The three objectives in terms of the magnification, well, it's usually four. You can't see one because it's behind. It's 4x, 10x, 40x, and 100x. And as I mentioned, so therefore, let me see if somebody could help me. The overall, if the objective magnification is 4x, 10x, 40, and 100, what is the total magnification for the 4x lens? Anybody, what's the total magnification? 40. 40. How you got 40? Because you multiply the um, 10 by the 4x. Yeah, the eyepiece from magnification the eyepiece. from the objective, and you're quite right. Very good. So for the 10x, what would be the magnification? 10x multiplied by, what's the magnification up here? This one doesn't change. It's always um, 10x. So therefore, the 10, total 100. will be 100. For the 40x, objective, which is what this one, when it comes across, the total magnification will be 40 multiplied by 10, 10 which 10. is 400. And the last one, which is the 100x, the magnification, which the 100x would give is 100 multiplied by 10, 10 right, which 10. is 1,000. Right? So the greatest magnification, this can give us 1,000 times what you would see. Uh, it magnifies up to 1,000. That's the greatest one. One it can give. So this is what we are just talking about in terms of how you calculate the magnification. To bring it into focus, so when in terms of bring it into focus, you have different controls. Um, you have the coarse focus and the fine focus. Now I would give when when you're finished and you're actually going through the lab on your own, I would give you a site where you could actually play around with a, a virtual microscope so you'd appreciate it a little more in depth. But just appreciate to bring it into focus. When you're looking through, it might be blurry. So you have to move this stage up and down. And to do it, you, could, you use this uh, control here, which is a course focus. So this moves it a lot 
whereas the fine focus will move it slowly. So between these two, in terms of moving it up and down, you could bring it into focus. Then you also have the coaxial stage controls. This knob here, it moves the stage left and right. So the coarse focus and the fine, it moves it up and down, whereas the coaxial moves it left and right. The stage, so on top of here, you'd put the sample that is on a slide, a glass slide, and that's how you move it around such that it falls beneath the lens so that you could visualize or see it. So the stage, that is where you put the slide itself and the light source is known as the illuminator. The arm, right? So this is the base, the different parts. The arm supports the tube. So, so arm is also known as the neck and the base is the bottom. It's usually very heavy. Why do you think the bottom of the microscope? It's very heavy for one particular reason, so that what would not happen? It won't break over. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it's, it wouldn't topple over. So I'd say it's very heavy for that reason. Let's talk about some structures within the cell now. You're looking through the microscope and you're looking at the cell. So what structures become available? The cell membrane, this is the outer part, the cytoplasm, which is the fluid filled part of the cell and the nucleus. Where would I find DNA? In which one of these three structures would I find the DNA? In the nucleus. In the nucleus. And the DNA is found on chromosomes. How many pairs of chromosomes does a normal, uh, a normal cell have? have human 23 cell. Pairs. 23. Right. It, it doesn't make sense. I don't need to teach you all know everything. That's excellent. <laughs> How do you remember the number 23? What is significant? When, when you hear the number 23, what significant comes to mind? For those of us who play basketball, old school was Michael, Michael Jordan. Jordan. Michael Jordan's number, right? And new school now, LeBron James, does he have 20? I think he uses 23. I don't know. He's moved around to so many different teams, right? So that's how I remember it in terms of, of, the, of, of the number itself. So 23 has the number of pairs of chromosome. The cell membrane, what does the cell membrane do? Stay, give me one function of the cell membrane. It begins it's with allowed. T. Mm -hmm, go ahead. Protection. Protection, very and good. Pass it. And involved pass it. in reproduction. It is involved in reproduction. And growth. And growth. Keep the yeah. organelles inside the... The cell itself, that is very true. Itself. Yeah, very good. So in terms of reproduction, when reproduction occurs, the cell membrane, actually, you would see it. You know, you have fusion of the membrane. If you're looking in terms of the male and female gametes, if you're looking at that, but for normal mitotic division, mitosis. So if I were to ask you this, what's the difference between mitosis? I don't know if you all looked at it um, in lecture, mitosis and meiosis. What's the difference, the major difference mitosis between- Mitosis used mm -hmm. with somatic cells and mitosis- um, <clears throat> No, you're correct, but that's very impressive that you use the word, uh, you use any terminology. Go ahead. Yeah, um, mitosis is with somatic cells and mm -hmm. meiosis is with sex cells. Excellent. I see you hit the nail on the head there, right? So the somatic cells are all the cells that are not um, the sex cells or gametic cells, gametes, right? So, and the other thing in terms of the replication with mitosis, you have an exact copy exact copies being made or clones and that is very why is that important if i were to tell you this when you're thinking about your skin cells and the skin cells they replicate via mitosis why is that important well if they didn't if they didn't um produce exact skin copy you know exact cells all the time and one day you wake up and you see your hairs growing on top of your hand right that wouldn't be very nice so that's why it's very important that they copy when you, they are removed, that they copy and they produce exact copies of themselves. Yeah, very good. Cytoplasm, is that important? What does the cytoplasm do? What's the function? Keeps things in place. It keeps them in place, yes, yes. What happens in it? So it's liquid, it's a liquid. What happens importantly it's there? Something that begins with the letter R and it's related to chemistry. Um, chemical reactions happen there. It don't make sense. I should leave now and go home. Well, actually, oh, I'm home already. That is, no, you're quite right. No, you're right. That's excellent. Yeah. And a lot of people don't appreciate that, but side reactions. So which is why when in terms of if you wanted to kill a cell, like a bacteria, unicellular organisms, what do you do? 
What could you do when you throw salt on something? What it does? Let me it's ask this question. Cre um, it causes, oh, you're thinking about cremation in terms of yeah. the cell membrane collapsing, right? And what you do is like, you know, with frogs, <laughs> God forbid. Anybody know, when you see a frog, what you throw on it? Salt. Oh, salt. Yes. And what does the salt do? Dehydrates. It dehydrates, right? Very good. Anybody here familiar with making salt fish? Anybody's lived close to the sea or whoever made salt fish from fish? Yes, sir. Talk to me how you make salt fish. Let me hear you. You just pack it with salt. Well, of course. So, yeah. mm -hmm, go ahead. So, well, um, what I saw my husband they doing, he would cut mm -hmm. the fish right mm -hmm. down the back, the body backbone, mm -hmm. right? And they would pack it with salt, they would mm -hmm. put it on paper, and they would put it up in the sun to dry. Right. Do they just leave it or do they change the salt ever so often? Ever so often, they'll, they'll um, remove the, um, the set salt of their fruits. And, and put fresh can... one. Very good. Yeah. And the reason why, because if you'll notice, the salt becomes wet. You know, it gets wetty or it'll change color. And that's because what it's doing, you're setting up um, movement of liquids from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration is known as what? There's a term for it beginning with D. Diffusion. 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 And specifically related to water, movement of substance from an area of high to low concentration is known as what? It begins with O. Osmosis. 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 When you take the fish and you pack it with salt, what you're actually doing, you're, you're creating what is known as a concentration gradient. That just is a big term that just means the concentration of the liquids is different on both sides of a membrane, right? When you're looking at the fish. So when you pack salt, salt, does it have a lot of water or a little bit of water in it? Anything about it? Salt. It doesn't have much water in it. It has what is known as water crystallization, but it's not much. But the fish has a lot of water in it. So based on our definition of osmosis, how does water move? Does it move from the salt into the fish or from the fish into the salt? From the fish into the salt. From the fish into the salt, right? From the area of high concentration, the water content, which is present in the fish, into the salt, which is where it has a relatively low concentration of water. And in so doing, right, so you're pulling out the water, you're pulling out the water, and you dry it off. And it's, but it's important that you change the salt because the salt becomes wet. And after a while, what will happen, the concentration of the water in the salt will actually be higher, and you have to switch it back and forth. And the water will start to move back into the fish. Not a good idea. So they change the, the when the salt becomes wet, they change it ever so often. But at the end of it all, what happens? The fish dries out. Now, why is that important for preservation? When you think about something that rots or when it dies, you have bacteria and other single cellular and multicellular organisms coming in. And what they do, they begin to eat the tissue or break it down. Now, these single cellular organisms, they have cytoplasm just like this. They have cytoplasm. Very important. In those cytoplasm, you have a number of different reactions, chemical reactions occurring all the time. One important reaction which takes place in the cell has to do with the breakdown of sugar. And it begins with G and it rhymes with glycolysis. Anybody know the name of it? Glycolysis. Glycolysis. glycolysis, yeah, yeah. Gly uh, glycolysis, excellent, very good. So the word glycolysis, it means it comes from glyco, which refers to sugar, and lysis, which means to cut. So one of the ways in which cells get their energy, they break down sugar. They take sugar and they break it down by a set of chemical reactions, which are governed by enzymes. So from breaking it down, glucose is brought down into glucose 6-phosphate. There's an enzyme that converts that glucose 6 to fructose 6 to fructose 1, 6 phosphate to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, and then to dihydroxyacetone, and a number of different reactions until it reaches the pyruvate, right? And then it's shuttled into the mitochondria and it generates energy, energy for the cell. And energy in a cell is in the form of three letters. It is a universal ATP. currency ATP. ATP. Yeah, very good. ATP. So glycolysis or the breakdown of sugars to generate energy for the cell, the first part of glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm and the second part occurs in the mitochondria, right? So this cytoplasm or the liquid portion, you have thousands of other reactions that occur. 
what happens now in terms of when you put salt on us, coming back to the question, when you put salt on fish, why does that preserve it and why does it not rot? When something rot or decays, this, what happens is that is as a result of toxic waste being produced by organisms, single cellular or multicellular, that actually eat up the tissue that is present and then they give off waste product and the waste product that they give off is what gives that funky smell. So the thing is this, if you could kill off or remove all of those organisms that usually break down the tissue, would you get a funky smell and would the tissue break down? The answer is no. And that's why they use salt. When they pack the salt, remember, so if you were to imagine that this is like a bacteria, right? So a bacteria, single cellular, um, granted, it, yeah, single cellular organism, it has cytoplasm, reactions occur in the cytoplasm. When you put the salt, you draw out the water, the liquid portion, which is what the cytoplasm is a majority can consist of mainly water. When you draw that water, what will happen, you think, to the bacteria? Da, 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 da. It will die because all of those reactions, which constitute metabolism, somebody mentioned it, those reactions will not occur. And therefore, if those reactions do not occur, well, the bacteria dies off. If you kill off all of the bacteria, those bacteria contribute to decay and putrefication or the rotting of the, of the um, tissue. Therefore, the tissue doesn't rot or putrefy, and it just stays there. And that's why salt is used for preservation. Basically, it pulls out the water present in the cytoplasm, not only of the what is being preserved, but for more importantly, for anything that could cause it to rot, all those bacteria that break down the tissue. We good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Everybody knew that already, yes? Kind of. Yes, okay. <laughs> I just kind of line it up for you. Fair enough. Let's go forward. So what we're looking at here, cytoplasm, very important. This is where the chemical reactions of the cell take place, and they're numerous, but primarily among them is glycolysis, which breaks down glucose to give energy. That's the full, anytime I hear about reactions in a cell, I always remember glycolysis, breakdown of sugar, right? That is very important. Okay. All right, so this, what we're looking at here is another cell. Let me ask this question. What does RER stand for? What do you think that stands for? And no plasmic recognition. Smooth or rough? Rough. rough? rough. How do you know it's rough endoplasmic reticulum? If you it look closely. It have... Go ahead. It have bumps? It will have the ribosomes on it. So the glue, the glue. And it's close and to the nucleus. Right. Yes, very good. And you know another way? If you look down to the bottom here, it says rough endoplasmic reticulum. One of the, whenever you see a diagram, it's always important to look at the bottom for a key, right? So that was not nice. <laughs> I know, that was rough. <laughs> that was rough. <laughs> yeah, that was naughty of me, right? But yes, it is the rough endoplasmic reticulum for reasons which were given just now. You're quite right. But whenever you see you do get a diagram, always remember to look at the bottom to see if there's a key that tells you what is going on. Yeah. So this is a cell where we're looking at. And ribosomes. What are the ribosomes important for in terms of their functionality? What do they do? Protein synthesis. Protein synthesis. Right. So protein, ribosome, anytime you hear the word ribosome, think about protein synthesis. Very good. And here we have the mitochondria. What do the mitochondria do? One word it begins with E. One word. Energy, energy. Energy, energy. Anytime I think about mitochondria and energy, you know what comes to mind? All due respect, if he's a relative of anybody, but Trevor Sills. Whenever you see her having a bad day, just go to YouTube, type in Trevor Sills, Mr. <laughs> energy and watch the video it will it will brighten you up i assure you but you know anytime i think about my energy and it's a very interesting video when you have the time to look at it i digress let's go forward so this is the mitochondria associated with energy production in the cell itself g golgi apparatus or golgi complex and that is associated with what one word begins with p and it happens when you buy groceries. What do they do with your groceries afterwards? Packaging. Packaging. Yeah. Very good. So always think but about. But it also these with... Go ahead. But doesn't it also these with uh, glycosylation? 
glycosylation in terms of adding on other things? Yes, it does. But the primary function is really packaging. You have other things, you know, in terms of things being added on, but the primary function is really packaging. Yeah. All right, so we have um, the Golgi apparatus. Here we have the nucleus. We have euchromatin and, nu and the nucleus itself. This is where you have your 23 pairs of chromosomes. Very important. When you hear of the nucleus, what is the nucleus critical for? Is a word that begins with R and is the most important thing among living organisms. It's a function that they do. Always appreciate that. That is the, what would happen if it did not reproduce? You would become extinction. extinct. Yeah, so that's why the bottom line is, that's why we are here as, um, as organisms. We're just here to reproduce, that is it. All right, from a biological perspective, that's why, that's why we are here, just to replicate, because without it, we would become extinct. Very good. Let's go forward. So now, let's just, well, we just, we spoke about the um, organelles, let's see if we could find some more. Lysosome, what is this, this, what is this important for? One word, lysosome, begins with D. Digestive I. Enzymes. One word, one word, yeah. one word, one word. Yeah. Give me two. Mm. Destruction. Thank you. Destruction. It does involve digestive enzymes, and you're quite right. But I just wanted to focus in, you know, sometimes you just gotta look. Some persons, you know, might not fully appreciate digestive enzymes and so on. So I just wanted one word. And but you're quite right in terms of they do contain digestive enzymes, right? And in fact, there's a process in which the cell kills itself. And what it does, it just opens out all these lysosomes. And that process, I wonder if anybody knows, it begins with what you're saying. It does not make sense. Let me go home. But I'm already home, so I can't go there. <laughs> but that's very good. Apoptosis, or sometimes the second P is silent. So you'll hear it pronounced as apoptosis. And apoptosis, sometimes you'll hear them mention it as uh, self uh, cell suicide or cell death. That is when, when would the cell want to kill itself? That's a very good question. Under what circumstance? Mm -hmm. If it is um, a bad copy. I hear what you're saying. If it's a bad copy, yes. And what happens transcriptionally, you do have um, a signal that is sent out to destroy it. If it does recognize up to a point when certain checks are run and it's, yeah, there's something went wrong, it would do it, yes. And when else would it want to kill itself? One word, it begins with I. And it rhymes with Zinfection. <laughs> yeah. If it is overwhelmed in terms of being infected, and yes, it is doing the cell signal into the T cells, the B cells, the NK cells to come and assist it, but it recognizes things are still going, these, these things, viruses or back is replicating too quickly. What it would do to avoid these viruses from going to the external environment, it would introduce or it would cause uh, apoptosis so that everything is destroyed. Right? It is not, as they say, it's indiscriminate with punishment. When these enzymes are released, it kills all the viruses and bacteria, but it also chop up everything. It would kill the cell itself. Very good. So that's lysosome. Let's move on. We spoke about the RER, which is nothing more than endoplasmic reticulum that has ribosomes studied on them. Uh, we mentioned the uh, nucleus in terms of the composition with the chromosomes themselves. The centrioles, very important for what process begins with R. 23, which process is that one? They're very important for? Reproduction. Reproduction or replication is very good, very good. All right, and then you have the plasma membrane, selectively um, permeable. So it doesn't allow any and everything to come in. It's like around Christmas time in normal time, you know, when people, paranderos come by your house, depending on who it is, what you do, you take off all your lights and you lie down on the ground. You don't let them to come into the house or into the yard. But if you do want them to come, well, you know, you leave the lights on and you go outside and you sit down and you're right. So plasma remain selectively permeable. Let's go. Right, so the cell, as you mentioned, really could be considered as a factory in terms of what it does. 
Membrane is like a gate, is selectively permeable. It allows things to come in and out. The nucleus is the CEO. It contains all the instructions in those 23 pairs of chromosomes. And it also stores plans for the proteins. All those things are written on those 23 pairs of chromosomes, already critical. The cytoplasm is where activities take place and is also most critically the site for these reactions. Another thing I didn't mention, the reactions that take place in a cell, they must take place in an aquatic or watery environment. That's important. If it doesn't, if you, so that's why when you remove the water, the, the reaction will not take place, it will stop. All right, so always remember that. And this maintenance of the constant internal environment, what is that known as again? It's a big word. Homeostasis. Homeostasis, right, homeostasis. That maintenance is very important. On that topic, the internal environment of the human body, what is our internal core temperature average? 36.3. We, 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 you're good, you're good, yes. Well, 37 is the average, 36.5 to 38.5 in that range, 37 being the average. Very good, yeah. And what happens when you go outside of that range? If your temperature was to remain at 45 degrees, your core temperature, for let's say an extended period of time, mm, let's say for a day, what would happen? Dot, 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 dot. So the cells will... Have that. Yeah, bottom line, you'll be talking with the ancestors. You'll be talking with the ancestors, right? You will no longer be in the land of the living, right? The cells would break down. Because at that height, remember these reactions, they take place... They're very specific and they take place at certain temperatures, certain uh, environmental conditions, namely a watery aquatic environment. So if you remove these uh, parameters, the reactions will not take place. The cell would shut down and cells, cells make up tissues, tissues make up organs, organs make up the 11 organ systems and 11 organ systems make up the entire body. So bit by bit, you'll start to have organ failure, organ system failure, and then ultimately you'll have body failure. The, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Just want to get a little bit um, more information on um, homeostasis, right? Yeah. So ideally you should get to the seven degrees. And like you were yeah. saying, if they are 45 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. Is it that um, the Fe cells stop taking on the amount of water in the cytoplasm for the reactions to continue? It's like it dries up or something? What what? happens exactly in terms one of the things you have to appreciate as well now the body i like to say it's glad that they use the word factory your body is a machine it's a dynamic machine so it adjusts itself when it recognizes you start to go outside of 37.5 degrees celsius it would do certain things so so normally so one of the things is that when your internal core temperature begins to go up what you find happening let's say if somebody has a fever or what what happens to them what is one of the things you'll see like on the forehead, the forehead? Yeah, sweat. They start a sweat. Sweating is one of the ways that the body actually tries to lower its temperature. Because in sweating, what happens is, yeah, well, sweating is one, unbeknownst to you, under your skin, you have your capillaries, you have vasodilation. So these blood vessels will expand so that more blood passes close to the skin. The more blood that passes close to the skin, remember your blood carries heat. So you lose heat via radiation. And additionally, that heat that passes close to the skin, it will evaporate the sweat that, that is accumulating on your skin. Now, when it evaporates the sweat, it actually cools you down. Now, that is strange. How could it be that you know you're evaporating something and you cool yourself down? Anybody ever put limacol on the forehead? forehead? Limacol or alcalado glacier? Yes, sir. Or perfume? The reason why you actually feel that, you know, you get this cold sensation when you put it on. What is happening there is the heat is literally, the heat from your body is vaporizing the perf perfume. So in a similar manner, your body gives off uh, sweat and it is being evaporated by the heat from your body and that actually cools it down. So you have to remember your body is a machine. So it wouldn't just... One of the things is your, your temperature will climb, but it will be, it will, your body will actually try to bring it back in line. There are receptors in your body, thermoreceptors, that are actually aware of what is going on. Um, 
in your brain stem, there's a control center which monitors the total, you know, the temperature, your core temperature. When you're beginning to go outside of that core temperature, your body will begin to try or begin to adjust to ensure that you fall back within range. Now back to what you were saying, uh, would, you, would the cells then dry out? Hardly likely. Have to remember as well, when you look at the body, we are circulating, there's circulating tissue fluid within the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system, what it is, as, the name, as I just mentioned, it has this fluid that bathes all of the tissues in your body. It keeps them moist. Not only that, it's also the repository for cells of the immune system, right? So your lymph, unless you have a shutdown of your lymphatic, that's one, two, shutdown of your cardiovascular, that's two, uh, it's very difficult for you to be alive and your cells internally begin to dry out. I hear what you're saying, so, but what about cancer? Those cells dry out on an organ as related to cancer because the tissues die, and that has to do with tissue necrosis, which is something different. When the tissues die, the body no longer has control over it, so it would dry out. And that, believe you me, is not a very good situation to be in when you have tissue death and necrosis. So all that being said, would it would normally under normal circumstances would the cells in your body dry out no because there are mechanisms in place that regulate the amount of moisture in your body itself and not only that you get the urge to drink um in terms of urination your tiss your sorry your urine will now become dark and you will not secrete as much water in your urine so you you'll get dark and a little bit of urine concentrated urine because your body reabsorbs the water from the urine itself so there are different mechanisms in place, which you will learn as you go on and looking at the organ systems, but your body is really a phenomenal machine within that regard, yeah. So, yes? So if it died from dehydration, that really means that your cells just dry out and you'd have nothing to support it and dies it. In terms of when you die from dehydration? Dehydration, yeah. Like no water for days and you're just, you know, dead. Oh, in a case like that, yeah. And it, <laughs> Yeah, so, so there's the other thing as well. Um, Excuse me, sir. Yes, go ahead. It's just more about like these, these systems not function as it should, mm -hmm. as opposed to having the fever itself, is that the, whatever is causing the fever is hampering your systems from functioning Correct. as within the time space that they're supposed to. So I don't think it's more about like drying out, but it's more about the functioning of the body in a cohesive manner that will cause you to eventually die. Because what are mm -hmm. mm -hmm. In terms, and you would see this when you look at cardiovascular system in, in year two, in your next year, when you go to SNF2. But your body's response to infection, one of the things is actually one pooling of blood in a localized area. So like if you get a cut, for instance, you see one of the things that happen is swelling. You know, the, the, local, the area would swell, you'd have blood clotting. And one of the reasons why the area swells, more blood is being brought to the area. Why? Because of the fact now you have an open wound, you're more susceptible to infection. So in the bringing of the blood, one, you're bringing more oxygen to which actually enhances uh, the repair mechanism associated with that torn or lacerated area. And also you're bringing cells of the immune system to come and prevent or break down any foreign invaders. Because your first line, your primary line of defense, your skin has been breached, right? So swelling is a natural thing which occurs. Secondly, your body of itself. Now, as I mentioned, in the brain stem, there's a regulatory mechanism, keeps your body at 37 degrees Celsius, core temperature. What happens in a case when you have either infection or is a serious, particularly with an infection, let's say viral infection. If you can imagine, you have to override this normal system. So your body actually overrides the system and tells it, look, we need to carry up the temperature. And why do we need to carry up the temperature? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, would that fall under hypothermia? Hypothermia is when hyper, it would be hyper. Hi, hi, ER. Yeah, ER, ER. Oh, is yeah, when it drops. But yes, it would be hyper, hyperthermia. So it actually increases its temperature, right? Carries it up. And the reason why is to kill the cells. 
back to you know how would increasing temperature kill the cell remember we mentioned certain reactions one reactions take place within a narrow or a certain temperature range and secondly the major component of most of the structures in a cell is proteins now proteins are very special let's go back to our whole the whole name of this um, course structure and function there's a very close link between structure and function if you change the structure of something as relates to cells or organisms for that matter, when you change, and related, sorry, to proteins. When you change the structure of proteins, you affect their functions. Proteins are, consist of amino acids, sequence of amino acids joined together, and they have certain structural components associated with them. They're linked by bonds. So this linkage of the amino acids, uh, it causes then the protein to be folded in a particular way. Right? You can think about origami, you know how you make little duck and them little, I don't know if they do it still or swan, you know, by folding it up. So there's a very specific way you have to fold it to get the swan. When something, when the temperature rises, what happens is, yeah, that folding goes away. So just imagine as opposed to it being folded like a swan, now it looks like just a ball of paper. Structure and function. By changing the structure, by raising the temperature, that will cause changing of the bonds associated with the amino acids in the protein. When you change the structure, the function of the protein changes. And that also contributes to killing the bacteria because now certain things, let's say the protective mechanism of the membrane, cell membrane, that is lost. Some of the reactions, those don't happen because it's outside of the range. So that's how you kill the bacteria. But in so doing as well, you also kill some of your cells, which is why when you do have a fever, you don't feel well because some of your own cells will die. But the, the greater good is that you're killing off the infection and no, your body will bounce back. So, you know, your body says, hmm, okay, we have two things. We have a serious infection here and we have, we could kill some of our cells but we have a serious infection which we really need to handle. You know what? Let me handle that infection because that could be problematic. So it raises your body temperature. Structure function destroys the structure of those proteins associated with the bacteria, with the viruses that is causing the issue. And that in, itself, in and of itself causes them to die. And now when it's die, well, of course, it recognizes infection is no longer present. The white blood cell count begins to go back down and then it begins to drop back the temperature down to the normal core temperature. Yeah. So always remember structure and function. Whenever you hear proteins, you should always remember that structure is closely related to function. How could we relate that to something we know? Anybody here is cooked fish? I ain't going to okay. ask it. Oh, like some people yeah. hesitate in this figure, but well, Sylvan so asked me to bring a shark from LMA, volunteer no information. No, no, I wasn't going to ask you. When you, you ever see when you take fish and you squeeze lime on it, what happens to the color of the fish? It gets opaque. Right, it gets opaque. That's a very good example which just shows structure and function. The structure of the fish itself, it actually changes from being light complected or transparent and that in and of itself, the transparency of the fish is associated with a certain uh, lining up of those amino acids. When you put the acidic lime juice, which has citric acid in it, when you put that on the fish, that acid actually breaks the bonds between the amino acids and you have a rearrangement of the bonds itself. And the rearrangement causes a color change, right? Because no longer is it this nice, well, quote unquote, nice, transparent fish but now it's opaque right an opaque solid fish and incidentally that is also used to cook fish right something known as let me see if we have any cereal ceviche. it doesn't make sense i should go home oh, a, yeah ceviche right so that is actually how you cook fish you could cook it just using lime because you get the same consistency just like if you cook it rearrangement and even when you cook when you cook food is the same thing happening when you cook the fish the heat is actually breaking bonds, they rearrange, and now you have a different structure, which is dot, 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 which is a cooked fish, right? So the breaking and re-establishment re of other bonds causes, that is really what cooking is all about. You're breaking down some of those bonds there. Breaking the bonds causes, well, usually when you're looking at meat, 
particular leaf is hard meat, you know, it causes it to get softer because you, you're interfering with the structure of the uh, proteins. Again, the bonds associated with the amino acids present in the protein. Yeah. Okay. We good? Yes, sir. All right, let's go. So endoplasmic reticulum, we mentioned packaging. Oh, sorry, this is the site of, of lipid synthesis. Sorry, the endoplasmic reticulum. The Golgi is associated with package endoplasmic. The smooth ER, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, lipid synthesis, the rough ER is associated with uh, membrane bound uh, protein synthesis. All right, very important there. And the Golgi, as we mentioned, packaging, finishing and packaging department, lysosomes. Uh, we mentioned that these are used to actually break things down. And we mentioned apoptosis, that function, mitochondria, the power plant. Right, now cell specialization. Let's look at some special cells. What type of cells is this one here? Red blood cells, erythrocytes. Red blood cells, red blood. erythrocytes. Yeah, very good. How many red blood cells do we have in our body? Well, first of all, how many liters, how many liters of blood do we have in our body? Approximately how much? Let me give you A, 2, B, 5, or C, 10. How many liters? How much orchard pack? You know, the one liter packs, how many orchard packs do we have, you think? 2, 5, or 10? 5. Five, well done. Yeah, on average, it's just five. So one thing I realized, we really don't have a lot of blood in our bodies, which is why when somebody is hemorrhaging, it's very important to stop that hemorrhaging because they really don't have a lot of blood. They really don't, yeah? And the other question is this now. Um, how much in, let's say, in a microliter of blood, how many red blood cells do we have? Approximately how much? A, one, B, five, or C, 10 million per microliter? 10 million. Pardon? Yes? I didn't hear, sorry, if you could repeat. How many red blood cells we have, approximately? Right, I think Fiona said it. Let me check the chat. I see like somebody. Oh, could you repeat it? I surely can. So, in a microliter of blood, how many red blood cells do we have? A, one, B, five, or C, 10 million. Right, so A, one million, B, five million, or C, 10 million in one microliter of blood. So, 10 million. 10 million. Okay, that was a good guess. But it's not correct, but that, it was a good guess, yes. Five, okay, Caitlin, I see Caitlin on the chat. That's it, spot on, five million, right? So five million. Now, how much is a microliter? A microliter is one thousandth of a litre, of a milliliter. So that means in one litre, since we have five million, we have 5,000 million, which is, a, which is a billion. So we have five billion in five million, yeah, five billion in one milliliter. So therefore in one liter, we would have five trillion, right? Five trillion red blood cells. So therefore in five liters, we'll have 25 trillion red blood cells. Typical human, human person, you have 25 trillion red blood cells. Let me ask you this, why, why do we have so many? Because the major function of the red blood cells is one word. It begins with I, and it rhymes with important. Important. Anytime you see any body, now the body is a machine. Whenever you see the production of certain cell types is done in great quantities, is because it is very important, yeah? Could you think of another cell type where the body produces a whole lot, a whole lot of them? White blood cells. White blood cells, Could very good, one. yes. Mm -hmm. And another mm -hmm. one related to the core reason why we're down here. Yeah. 
reproduction cells? Reproduction. So when we're looking at sperm cells, right? How much? So when we're thinking about it, um, in terms of a normal ejaculate, a normal ejaculate consists of about five milliliters of, of semen. And usually in, in one milliliter of ejaculate or in semen, one milliliter of semen, you have anywhere from 40 to 300 million sperm. So let's use our average there, let's say 200 million sperm per milliliter. That means for five milliliter, which is on average, 200 by five, that is one billion sperm, right? Per ejaculation in, or in five milliliters of semen. Why does the body produce? And all you need is one. So why does it produce a billion? Because it's very important. As we mentioned, if we didn't replicate, what would happen? We become, we become extinct. We become extinct. So therefore, this is so important. Dude, that is really good odds. One in a billion. That's pretty, you know, only one has to reach, you know, the neck of the fallopian tube in terms of fertilizing an ovum. Yeah, that's pretty good odds. Right, so that's why. So when you see things, cell type, rep, reproduction, and also red blood cells, the reason why oxygen is very important. Why is the oxygen important? Why do we use oxygen in our bodies? We use it to break down what? One word begins with F, four letters, rhymes with good. Food. Yeah, we use the oxygen to break down food. And we, when we break down the food, what do we get? Energy, energy in the form of ATP. So it is so important. That's why we produce so many. This is something that is critical and central to life. Other reason we produce so many sperm cells, it is critical to life. If we didn't have them, we become extinct. So cell specialization, very critical in the body. And in particular, those two, do keep them in mind. Other ones, of course, your neurons are very important. Neurons, interestingly, you know, they generate an electric charge. At a specific point on the neuron right around here is an area known as the axon hillock. You all looked at, um, you all looked at the neuron already in lecture? Yeah, okay. yes, but I said she would but go not more in depth you. when we reach um, that particular system. Right, right. oh, I the thought, so that I means you, you haven't reached the nervous system yet, right. Okay, so there's a special region right around here known as the axon hillock because it looks like a little hill. So this is the really the cell body within the cell body. So this could be compared to like a cell. So you have a nucleus inside of there, you have the cytoplasm, you have a membrane, you have these um, extensions, which are known as dendrites. Right? So which one of these three do you think a dendritic cell will look like based on what I just said? Which one do you think a dendritic cell will look like? This one, this one, or this one? The, um, the, the one like in the lichen. Yes, correct. Because dendrites mean these little projections. And when you see a dendritic cell, it looks very much. And those are cells associated with the uh, immune system. And you find them in moist areas, such as the mouth, nasal cavity, such as the degree the rectum, and also the vaginal passage. Right? They're there for protection. They offer protection in those areas. Right? And they have these projections. So they call them dendritic cells. Right? But with this one, the axon hillock here, and as you rightly say, you're going to a little more detail, you know, with Miss, with Dr. S Dr. Sitar, right? That's a lecturer. Yes, yes sir. Right, right. So in this area, it's known as the axon hillock, because it looks like a little hill. You have sodium channels. And I just talked briefly on it. What's the importance of sodium channels? Well, what do you think? If you have a channel or a door and it opens and is labeled sodium door, what do you think will run in? Sodium. sodium. Sodium, yeah. Very good, yeah. So with the axon hillock, when the sodium gates open, and that's caused by uh, when a certain threshold is reached, or when a certain amount of uh, impulses come from other cells, the sodium gates open. Sodium, which is present in the surrounding, what they call the milieu, the surrounding environment, right? All of this is liquid. They have sodium cells floating around in the liquid. It, they rush in. Now, sodium ion has what charge associated with it? A positive or a negative charge? A positive. A positive charge. Now, usually on the inside of the membrane, so on the inside of the door, it's negatively charged. So what happens when a whole lot of positive charge go in, you think? 
What will happen to the negative charge? It will go come out. Yeah, very good. It changes. It changes yeah. from negative to positive. And that is what is known. It, the changing from inside negative to positive is known as depolarization. Right? Because you're changing the pole. We have two poles, positive and negative. These sodium ions, the gates open in response to these impulses coming down the dendrites from other cells. Sodium rushes in, it causes the inside membrane to change from inside negative to positive. And that's known as depolarization. So you know, you hear the term when you're looking at neurons, depolarization occurs. And that depolarization causes this wave of positive charge now to run, move down the axon. Because you know, when you have a negative and a positive charge, they attract, yeah? So sodium rushes in, it changes the charge to positive, but the area next to it is negative. So it pulls the charge and the charge keeps moving down, 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 down. And that's how it moves down, right? And it skips along. It skips along as it goes down. I wouldn't get into too much detail about that. I will leave the fun for your lecturer. But that's how you have, um, you have the charge moving on the inside of the neurons. These are very specialized cells. It's the only cell in the body that could actually literally generate an electric charge. And specifically, the charge is generated or caused by these gates opening, sodium gates, in the specific area of the axon hillock. If, there is, if they don't open, you wouldn't have depolarization and the generation of what is known as an action potential. It wouldn't happen at all. Very, very specific for that area, right? So do keep that in mind when you're looking at the nervous system. Let's look at some other cells. We mentioned the sperm and the egg, ovum. Fertilization occurs specifically in the neck of the fallopian tube. After fertilization, could implantation usually occurs in the uterus. Uterine wall. Does it, is that the only place where it could occur? No, sir. No, it could occur all over the place, right? And yeah. in those cases, what type of pregnant are you? Ectopic pregnancies, pregnancy, right? You you would actually um you'd actually see that more in uh oh shoot sorry I think I, I pressed unfortunately asked to unmute I really was, was muting off some things there you'd see that when you look at reproduction so I wouldn't speak more to that here's the liver cells or the hepatocytes right so this belongs to the um your liver cells smooth muscle cells sperm and egg cells. Right, now let's talk about division. We're almost there. All right, let's go. Mitosis, a process whereby a cell divides, notice two identical daughter. And this is known as cloning, identical in every regard. And it has four main phases, PMAT. I always think about it for those of us who have a cat at home, fluffy, you know, when fluffy comes in, they like to pee on mats. So you can remember that in terms of um, mitosis. PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Which of these phases is the easiest one to identify out of the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase? The metaphase. Right, metaphase. Why? Because it's over across the middle. And I can tell you, usually for multiple choice questions, if they ever bring in images, 10 to 1, they will bring a metaphase because you'll see them lined up. It's usually a favorite. Yeah. All right. So do. In particular, not presenting the other phases, take note of this when the alignment occurs across the equator or equatorial region of the cell itself. So the spindle fibers move across, right? And then you have the extension of the fibers uh, that cause the separation eventually. Let me ask you this. On the edges of these of the chromosomes, they have caps. And what are those caps called? It begins with T, incidentally. Now, this is not an... Well, is it on the syllabus? I don't think so. I'll just mention it. They're called telomeres, right, or caps. And the reason why I point it out, it has been speculated that as you get older, the telomeres wear off. They get shorter. Correct, they get shorter. And because they get shorter, they expose the ends of the chromosomes. And because they extend the end of this chromosome, now they begin to wear down. And because they wear down, some of the information is lost and you begin to age. <laughs> So the theory is, if you could find a way to keep the telomeres on, you will, da 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 you'd live, theoretically, you'd live forever. You wouldn't die, you know? So it's an interesting concept. And when you have the time, you could read up on it. 
mitosis. So let me have, let's have a look at some cells. Da, da, da. So mitosis is going on, as you see, in terms of these divisions here, right? And this is probably an onion root tip. In your body, where would you find the fastest growing cells? Can you give me an example where you find very fast growing cells? And I'll give you another hint. When you go for a COVID test, okay, not the news. <laughs> when you go for a paternity test, if ever you did see one being done, they rub the swab in that area. Inside of your mouth? Inside, inside your cheek cells, yeah. Those cells, are, uh, they, they, um, they come out very quickly, the cheek cells. The cheek and the mouth is part of which uh, structure in your body that runs from mouth to anus? Oral. Pardon? Digestive. Your digestive, well, digestive. right, correct. Digestive system, right, right, the digestive tract. And it's part, so interestingly, all along the digestive tract, those are cells which replicate very, very quickly. Why do you think they have to replicate very quickly? Let's say when you're looking at your um, intestine, your small intestine, your large intestine, why do you think the cells lining the small and large intestine, they always have to keep replicating? Because things are constantly rubbing. Ah, well. you hit the nail on the head there. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Crystal. You keep rubbing the food when you're eating, yum, 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 chicken, yum, yum, you know, roti, yum, yum, yum. You have lobster roti up in Santa Cruz or something like that. Hmm, interesting, right? So when you constantly eat these things and it's going through your digestive tract via peristalsis, the alternate squeezing, you know, of the food as it goes down from mouth to anus, they keep rubbing. And what would happen if the cells didn't just give way, you know, rub off with the food? What would happen? Suppose some of the cells say, you know what, I really want to keep this replication going. I stay in right here, not moving. What would happen, you think? One word begins with T. And associated with friction. Because the food then would rub up against it. And you remember, the cell's not coming off. So what you'd have happening? Something begins with T, and it happens usually when you have friction. Tension. Tearing. Tearing. I like a, a tension is also another concept, which is true. You do have tension building up in the wall, which would eventually lead to tearing. So you're both correct, right? So very importantly, when you do swallow food, it comes off, all the cells. Now, what does that have to do with cancer medication by chance in terms of chemotherapy? Uh, when you, I don't know if anybody knows of, of persons who undergoing chemo or what have you not. But when you undergo chemotherapy, what happens? Well, you lose the ability to, or one of the side effects, cancers are very fast growing cells, yeah? They grow very fast. And in fact, the reason, because of the fact that they grow very fast, they pile up, they're like bad cells. It have certain rules that occur when you're looking at cell replication. One of the rules states that, okay, after you replicate, you had to lay down flat. We only replicate in sheets. But what do cancer do? Now nah, I'm following them rules, let me pile up. So they pile up. And when these cells pile up, what do they form? Something that begins with T. And tumors, right? So they replicate very quickly. So therefore, what do you think? Cancer medications target cells which replicate very quickly. And what are among the cells that replicate very quickly? All the cells of the digestive tract from mouth to anus. So in, in particular, the lining of your stomach. So that is why when persons who take chemotherapy, what happens? They usually lose their appetite. They don't want to eat because of the fact the cells, the medicine is actually targeting and destroying the cells of your stomach. But there's one thing you could take for that. What you could take is a, is, is a, is a plant that grows in the ground that opens your appetite. Marijuana. Thank you. The active ingredient in marijuana is delta-6 cannabinoids. Well, it's a class of drugs known as cannabinoids. And cannabinoids have been found to open your appetite. If ever you've been around somebody who, well, now it's legal, so I could speak freely on it, who has consumed, let's say, marijuana, usually they get what is known as the munchies after they smoke. They want to eat something, you know, they want to snack or, or what have you, not eat something. And actually, quote unquote, medicinal marijuana has been used for decades in terms of for person cancer patients to open up their appetites. All right. So do remember that lining of the digestive tract, you do have mitosis occurring rapidly because those cells, they have to replicate quickly because of the fact they're constantly being rubbed off as you swallow food. On that note, which, which one do you think is longer, your small intestine or your large intestine? 
interestingly enough. Like small small intestine. Intestine. Why would your small intestine be longer than your large intestine? One word begins with A. Right, and I'll say Objection. nothing more on it. Excellent. I wouldn't say anything more on it. You will deal with that when you look at digestion. But because most of the absorption occurs in your small intestine. The main, what is the main type of thing absorption that occurs in the large intestine? One particular substance begins with W. Water. There you go, water, water. That is why when your large intestine is not working well, what happens to your stools? Water. <laughs> when you sit down on the toilet. <laughs> yeah. Right, you have watery stools and you spray it all over the place. I digress, let's go forward. Active and passive transport, referring to the transfer of material. And just the only difference is one requires ATP or a source of energy. But this is how you move things across a membrane. Diffusion, we mentioned this at the top of the class, is simple movement of particles from the area of high to low. High low is very simple. From high low, because of one thing, and why would they want to move from the area of high concentration to an area of low? It has to do with a word that begins with E. And let me throw a word to you, Trevor Sills, or Trevor energy, says, energy. 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 It's energy. Energetically, it's more feasible to go from high to low than low to high. Every, anybody familiar with High Street in San Fernando? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, which one easier, walking from Library Corner down to Courts or down to PTSC bus station at the bottom or walking from the bus station up to the Library Corner? Which one easier? Uh, from the top to the bottom. Yeah, top to the bottom. And similarly, in terms of movement, from area of high concentration to low because of energy requirements, it's a lot easier for that to happen, right? Passive, and now this for osmosis, right? So this example here of osmosis, osmosis is specifically water moving from the area, its area of high concentration to its area of low concentration. Here you have a concentrated sugar solution. So therefore the concentration of water is low Whereas with a dilute, you have high water here. So it moves this way. Now, hmm, let me see. There's a, this, the concept of osmosis, right, is also used in a plant up in Point Lisas to create fresh water. But they don't use normal osmosis, they use reverse osmosis. What do you think reverse osmosis is? Uh, area of um, low concentration to high. Thank you very much. Yeah. So when you look at seawater, seawater as, com as compared to, let's say, pure water. So seawater has some, you know, fresh water in it. But when you look at pure water, it has a lot more pure water in it. Now, normally the tendency will be to move from the high concentration, which is the pure water, into the salt water. But what they do, they run under pressure and through a special filter. It takes a lot of energy. They push it from low concentration, which is in the seawater, into, let's say, a vessel with pure water. And that's why it's done in the sal plant, is a process known as reverse osmosis. So they just reverse the process of osmosis using salt water as the starting substance. Right. These are the different things when you put the blood cells in different medium or surroundings in an isotonic. Isotonic means the surroundings are the same. You have no change in the size. Hypertonic and hypotonic. Somebody wants to explain to me what is happening in terms of the change in the shape. What is happening here in terms of the movement of water? So when you try to connect, sir, it loosens water. Mm -hmm. So sorry, say it one more time. Uh -huh. Right, correct. The answer is losing water. Yes. And hypotonic it will be taking on water. So the size is bigger. Mm -hmm. Correct. So in a hypotonic medium, right? So therefore. What you have happening is the loss, you're having the movement of the water to the external environment, right? From low to high, 
And in so moving, it causes the cell to shrink. With a hypotonic, it moves from the external to the internal environment. Now, when you're talking about hyper, it's talking about well, like the dissolved solutes. So it has on the outside, it has a lot of dissolved solute, but a relatively low amount of water compared to the inside of the red blood cell. So that's how thing, that's why the water moves from the area of high concentration within the red blood cell to the area of low on the outside. With a hypotonic, again, is referring to all the other solutes. It means hypo means low. You have a low concentration of other things and a high concentration of water on the outside. It moves from high to low, from the outside to the inside. And that's how it swells up like this. Yeah? Very good. Right, passive, this is just speaking to it, different transport mechanisms. Facilitated, you use a specific carrier protein, right, to get it in, right, very unique proteins. And you'd see more of this even when you're looking at neurons, when you're looking at the uh, neuromuscular junction, you'd appreciate this in terms of uh, these channels that open. Passive transport, filtration. Where would you find this? This structure is located where? All of these things, which organ? It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, very good. Yeah, it does occur in the kidneys, right? Right, active transport. This is using ATP, and this is to use, so you're using energy to transport things across the membrane itself. Exocytosis. This is when the vesicles fuse with the membrane, releasing their contents to the external environment. Endo is the reverse of exocytosis. You're taking something from the external environment and bringing it to the internal environment. Let me ask this question. In terms of the composition of the vacuole membrane and the plasma membrane, what could you say? Are they a, the same, B, different, or C, you can't tell. The composition of the, this membrane and the composition of this membrane. Is it A, the same, B, different, or C, you can't tell? So I think it's the same because they actually take a piece of the plasma membrane. Yeah, you're very correct, and that's exactly it. And it's very efficient because of the fact after you take it in, then you can do exocytosis using, let's say, the same vesicle. It's very easy because now it fuses with the membrane and it becomes part of the membrane and releases it out. So it's a very efficient mechanism in this regard. And you're very correct. Well done. Okay. So today, what we looked at, we looked at the microscope and then we went on further. We looked at the cell and we looked at the structures. We explained some of the importance, the the, sorry, we explained the importance of the cytoplasm of the cell and also of the organelles within the cell itself. We then looked at cell division as it relates to mitosis. We didn't mention meiosis. We look more at that when you're looking at rep reproduction. Looked at some of the specialized cells in the body, namely the red blood cells, sperm cells, sperm cells, and also the neuron. We mentioned some of the adaptations associated with structure and function and the importance of all of them. Finally, we looked at transport mechanisms associated with the cells, some which involve energy, some which don't involve energy, and of course, the very the final thing we looked at, the importance of recycling of the membrane, it's very efficient, okay? All right, let me uh, stop the recording then. Uh, well, let me